So, uh, Lucy, I'm not uh, entirely sure, sure if this was a slide deck that you had initially uh, started to compile or if this was from a previous book club. It could have been from um, either Russ, who was cohort one, or uh, Colin, who was cohort two. But I'm going to go ahead and just go okay. ahead. Well, I'm going to I'm going to quickly go through this slide deck um, as a point of topic. This is not going to be 100% of what I'm going to be working from. My intent, what I mentioned to Lucy, everyone, was that HTML, cascading style sheet, CSS, and JavaScript is better conveyed if you see the content in motion, if you actually witness the generation or the document object rendering the instructions that we're providing, whether it be through HTML, through CSS, or through JavaScript, rendering it to the screen. And the, I guess the intent or the, the, the purpose behind this particular chapter in relation to Mastering Shiny, we are writing our code in a format of our studio. We're writing our scripts, we're writing our uh, instructions in a more R shiny format or R language type format. When you use the function of knit, okay, when you knit your system or knit your, your uh, application, what you end up doing, uh, let me stop this real quick. And okay, it's not knit, sorry. When you run the app, when you run the app, what happens is our studio creates this. Uh, web server okay and i have to be careful because it's 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 even more um dynamic or it's it's more integral than that it's not just the web server itself it's actually taking the language from what you've written and then compiling it into html javascript and css we have the ability we are nudged in the ever mo most uh minor way to actually start writing your own CSS, your own JavaScript, and your own uh, HTML into this R language type format. So that when you run the app, the web server that has generated this doc document object model that is generated is able to transpose what you have previously written into more HTML, sorry, in more web friendly format. Now, the bridge that I'm attempting to create by showing you in a dynamic form is the fact that, again, we're, we're writing most of our shiny formats in our studio or in the R language. And that by running the app, I magically generate this, this uh, web-friendly framework. There's no magic to it. It's a compiler. So you're, you're, you're actually transposing one language into another. You can nest, you can insert, you can put content, CSS, scripting, uh, HTML directly into your Shiny application. And then by rendering it or, or transposing it into another web server, all of a sudden it becomes recognized by the, the World Wide Web framework, this document object model I'm referring to. All right, let me just show you what I'm referring to because our studio in its own right, this application that we're all very familiar with, this is actually built on a web server or it's built uh, on a JavaScript framework. As an example, if I were to highlight just a section, right click and say inspect element. Now, most people don't do this and it's not a requirement for you to do it, but in a recognition of the underwebbing or the undertone of how all of this works, I can say inspect element. What you'll notice happen is all of a sudden I get this, um, more debugging form of, of what exactly am I looking at? Well, these are all of your different div tags. Over on the right-hand side is all of the attributes or the classifications, the IDs, the uh, metadata that goes along with these particular tags over on the side. So I guess my, my reasoning for showing you this inspect element is the fact that even our studio as a program running on your computer is technically a web-friendly framework. It is built on top of that uh, engine or that service. Okay, let's get out of here. All right, that always uh, gives people a little bit of a pause uh, when they see so much generated code all over the screen. Right, but there is a reason and a purpose behind all of that. So the the example I wanted to show real quick, and I will go through an outline. But um, 
by default, if you just start a Shiny app, if you immediately say, I want a brand new Shiny app, uh, do I want it in a uh, two file format or do I want it in a single file format? Well, there's an there's a implicit question that you need to answer with that, that statement. Normally, if you just want a simple application, you can run it in an app.r. That's a single file. And what you're going to do is you'll have your user interface and your uh, server in the same container, the same text file, right? This, this R script file. Otherwise, you can break the, both of them out where you have a UI, a user interface, that's your, your compiled document object, your browser window. And then you can have your server functions, which is the relationship between uh, providing that information to the UI. Again, that's up to you as a developer. Uh, I'm going to recommend as you developed or as you, as you gain maturity in the use of Mastering Shiny or Shiny in general, that you may want to start using the two file format and then we'll start adding extra additional details, your cascading style sheets, your JavaScript frameworks, your manual pages, uh, uh, information pages. All of this now becomes a very uh, folder placement of where you want some of your media, even, even your images can go into a particular resource folder. Okay, so let's run this app real quick. And again, by run app, I'm generating this web output, okay, this, this web server, and I'm providing this to the screen. Well, it's easier to see it when we're in a active window. Okay. Now, doing this again, where I go into our developer tools, so taking any of the browsers, uh, Firefox, Chrome, Safari, uh, most of your internet explorers and your edges, uh, you can drop into a developer tools service, and that's usually F12 is the shortcut to that. Now, if I, if I look at a particular text on the uh, uh, browser, the, the, the user interface, I'll just highlight this old faithful, old faithful geyser data. Okay. This is a heading level one text. I'm containing or uh, adding the, the placeholder, the, I'm putting the words Old Faithful Geyser Data into that heading one location. That heading one has some cascading style sheet attributes that would be applied that renders it at a font size XYZ uh, and that it takes up this particular space on my screen. So right click and say inspect. And what I want it to do, let me see if I can zoom in because it's gonna be really small for your screen. All right, I guess it's a heading level two, forgive me. All right, what I wanted to show you is that I have this body tag, right? So the body is, is really the um, workhorse or the, the place where most of this uh, content is placed. Your HTML is put into the body of your, of your document. Uh, we have this body, data new, uh, GRCS check loaded, um, some numeric value. Uh, we have a div class container fluid. So that's going to be the entire page, the, the fluid page. Um, then we have this heading level two old, fa old faithful geyser data. Now inside there, we can see that we have another row and I've got some information inside that row. And if I expand completely, eventually what I'm trying to get to is some scripting because when I move my slider back and forth, all right, you can, you can see the histogram is changing, but what, how does this all apply? What, what am I doing here? Well, again, keep in the back of your mind, HTML, cascading style sheet, and JavaScript are all three uh, purposes within your document object model. So when I'm putting instruction to that Shiny app, or I'm putting instructions to my web server or by my HTML page, I'm explicitly uh, giving credit or pointers, actual references to where the document object model can find this information, render or compile that, and then present it to the screen. As I expand each one of these elements, right up top, I'm wanting you to highlight the fact that I'm the 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 debug is um, encapsulating. Let me get out of that real quick. There we go. Um, I'm trying to showcase the fact that as I scroll up and down my script or my, my, my uh, information at the bottom of the debug, 
uh, I'm highlighting those cells within the document itself, the document object model itself, the DOM itself. And the instructions that we're providing, the ability for it to render, the um, idea that when I move my slider back and forth and I have a reactive call back to the server that provides more information and updates the histogram, all of this interaction is between these three different file formats. So let's go back to our presentation because I know I'm going too far down the rabbit hole here. And if I go to this theme and say knit this, I closed this window a moment ago. While this is rendering, does anybody have any particular question? Lucy asked the, the statement about the sidebar panel. Uh, does anybody have any questions or have some experience in HTML, JavaScript, or CSS development that maybe you, you came to this presentation with a curiosity? No, all right, we're good. All right. So we're going to reference a particular library called BSLib. Now, BS stands for bootstrap. Uh, bootstrap is more of a, uh, we'll call it a library of accessible media that we just call on it. It's called a theme. And <clears throat> when you're theming um, a web page, uh, it's mainly attributed to the JavaScript, but there's some other, excuse me, cascading style sheet, but there's some other JavaScript details that also come in as well. When you're theming a web page, it's more of when I place this heading level one or heading level two or this table, this uh, uh, slider bar, uh, sl sidebar uh, um, slider, what are the attributes that I want to apply to it? And you can give it explicit instruction to say, I want it to be color themed this, I want it to have these particular fonts, I want it to have this size on my screen, right? Bootstrap is an ability for you to immediately just access and say, I'm going to apply this particular theme and magically, magically my entire web page changes to that new format. Um, I don't know if you're you're going uh, shopping uh, for um, interior decorating and you're looking at you know the the styles that you want to apply to your living room and to your kitchen and to your bedroom. Um, I, what colors of sheets do I want to use? What uh, color of couch? What type of fabric do I want to use? All of these same questions can be applied to development of a web page as well. The ideas or the objectives that you're answering can be applied to this to this web page as well. And BSLib is is a, a quick way of filtering through those different uh, swatches, I guess, and and choosing what um, choosing what others have already developed for you to make your web page look the way it does. All right, let's keep going. We also have our HTML tools, uh, which gives us that access. If I place any form of HTML directly into my script file, it will render uh, as a uh, output to the, the browser's window itself. And then obviously the library is shiny. And again, I'm unfamiliar with who authored the slide deck, if it was Lucy, if it was Colin, or if it was uh, uh, Russ from cohort number one. Um, I'm accessing these slides with the intent that I need to give attribution back to the person that originally authored these. Uh, Mastering Shiny is a moving target. Much of the content for layout themes, HTML chapter was originated uh, as part of the basic UI chapter. Hence, these notes have a greater emphasis on a lower level web concern. And again, I've already kind of bridged into that lower level thought process, right? We've talked about these other file formats and, and I know know that it, I'm not making sense of how they actually apply to the, the greater picture of just generating an output. The learning objectives for chapter six are going to be creating a raw HTML using the R uh, service HTML elements, both attributes, classes, and content. These are vocabulary terms that will apply in the common web language. Uh, what I'm referring to is the World Wide Web Consortium. Uh, this idea that uh, we have a group of individuals that are managing most of the languages that generate for web development. We talk about CSS for styling, bootstrapping, and related front-end toolkits. Uh, Shiny produces a single-page application. And this is, for the most part, when you just in initially create a Shiny app, it is a one-page 
application. It doesn't have any other depth. Uh, you can, um, what's the word, horizontally spread out your Shiny app uh, or maybe scroll up and down, right? So I have more information as I continue scrolling. Um, or we can start adding more depth to our Shiny app by creating additional pages. Right? So when I uh, select this tab, I can jump into another location uh, and, and almost have a, a completely different service altogether. Uh, but multiple page layouts are possible. And that's my point is by adding extra tabs, by adding extra features, you can uh, generate a more user-friendly environment for your Shiny app. Right? The larger scalable uh, Shiny allows you to scale quite uh, extensively if you so choose. Keep going. Uh, some resources that are related to <clears throat> HTML language or, or HTML technology, uh, web technology. Uh, we have the awesome Shiny extensions. Um, I've used this in the past. Uh, what this website is going to do is not only uh, render some of these newer services, but also give you the instructions or um, particular scripts, uh, uh, points that you can add to your Shiny app and then be able to utilize or, or uh, apply some of these features. Uh, we have the Shiny application layout guide. Um, this is important in most documentation services. You will have a style guide. Um, if you're a tech writer, if you're uh, being able to um, work on, uh, I don't know, authoring some publication, some document that you're, you're working towards. Um, Lucy, if I can use you as an example, um, you're writing your master thesis. If you're a PhD and you're writing your doctoral thesis, all of these services, you usually have a style guide. I want all of my headings to do this. I want certain sections to, to contain um, this particular information. My figures have to be placed in a certain way. Do I want my, my figure caption on the top or the bottom? All of those styles are important. Within Shiny, we have this application style guide. And so it provides us that window of opportunity, answering that question one that, that Lucy had asked initially. If you choose, if you want, you can go into the Mozilla Development Network. Um, this is a really awesome page. I will tell you that it has a lot of depth and it's not gonna be related to Shiny. <laughs> it's gonna be more web friendly uh, or web technology oriented, but it does expand into the preamble, the HTML page itself, the heads, the, the titles, the bodies, the scripts, et cetera. And I'm calling out on these particular tags in reference to what uh, the Mozilla network is gonna provide you. How do I develop an HTML page? Not in Shiny, not in our studio, just a, a common textual file with the extension of HTM. What content do I need to place inside there to render or to make that web page work? The CSS first steps, uh, it's going to give you some instruction on some of the attributes you can apply to each one of the CSS classes. Uh, we have our website, uh, website parsing figure. I'm not sure what that is and I haven't opened that link. Uh, going into some books, we have our outstanding user interfaces. I have not opened that book before or I've, I'm not familiar with the uh, reference. You can, will, should, I recommend that you go to the Bootstrap link. Um, Bootstrap does provide you an exhaustive form of being able to, to flip through that look and feel. Um, when I render or apply a bootstrap to my Mastering Shiny, what you're, what you're answering or what you're choosing there is, what colors do I want to apply? What theming do I want to apply to it? The placement of some of my uh, columns and rows in my web app. Okay, bootstrap provides you that language that makes it very, very easy and simple to do. Um, SAS, okay. Let me just briefly cover exactly what these uh, this acronym or, or applies. I don't remember what the acronyms uh, SASS is. If I said CSS is cascading style sheet, you also have SAS, which is a newer form of CSS. Now this isn't the protocol of CSS version one, version two, version three. What SAS is, is a completely rewrite in a more object oriented format or a more um, theming type of style. And this is important in the idea in web development that when I write a instruction for a heading level two, 
anywhere on that web page, any, any place in that web page where heading level two is used, I can go into my cascading style sheet, change that one line, and magically everything else gets modified. Every heading level two gets modified. What SAS provides you is this service that I have multiple themes to choose from. So I can write all of these. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not explaining it the right way. Um, let me do it this way. Sorry, team. I want to take you on a tour that will answer this statement of what SAS is. In a lot of the current services that I operate in, I've been using a application called Reveal.js. Now, Reveal.js is an entire web framework. It provides the ability of generating a slide deck that would emulate or replicate similar to a PowerPoint or similar to uh, Google Slides um, or Mac. I can't remember, is it Slides in Mac? It provides an ability of a web-friendly service to generate output. Our studio uses Reveal.js. Um, is it Zarnigan? Uh, Brendan, if you don't mind me asking, um, I think you had posted a link of how to pronounce Zarnigan, and I'm, I know I'm completely butchering it. Um, ultimately, that web-friendly slide application is built on top of Reveal, uh, or they, they interact with each other. Why am I taking you in this path? Because technically, Reveal uses SAS. So if I can open up my, where's my GitHub page here? Just go to the developer's GitHub page, and I want to go into CSS. Uh, they're not using SAS, they're using C, uh, SCSS, but we'll get the idea of what's going on here. Um, <clears throat> during the compiling or during the rendering of your output, this HTML page, I'm taking instructions from JavaScript, HTML, and CSS. I pass it through this uh, run app or Node.js build app. And then what I get on the output is my uh, actual files. The format that I have it in the source media is going to be authored in, in one format. When I run it through the compiler and I output another side, the actual cascading style sheet gets generated instead. So yes, they're the same, but no, not technically. It's, it goes through this rendering engine and there's applies a bunch of theming and some linting that goes on to generate an output. Um, SAS is awesome, but it's very advanced in the relation as a comparison to actual CSS. All right. And then we have some final R packages, HTML tools, um, uh, SAS, uh, BS lib, uh, Thematic, uh, Shiny semantics, Shiny mobile, Shiny material, and Shiny dashboard. Again, I want to show you real briefly this rendered dashboard. In most of the examples that we have from chapters one through chapters six, we have used fluid page as the primary container that we put all of our media into. Um, you can use a shiny dashboard instead, and it will generate a similar output. What the shiny dashboard gives you access to is a huge quantity of additional features, not bootstrapping, but these additional placeholders uh, of interactivity. As an example, I'm going to briefly take you to a page that I'm actively working on. Um, I spoke to Lucy at an earlier point in time, and I was mentioning that I'm working on uh, deploying a training application into Guinea, Africa, uh, specifically Campsar, uh, as a location. Now, I'm representing my organization with this service, so I'm not going to take you any further than here, because if not, I'll start to get into some sensitive data. But what I wanted to at least highlight in this relation is this is called a shiny dashboard. And what we get is a title of that side column. We have these various, uh, what are these called? They're, they'll take you to a new page. Um, there's a term for this, and I'll try to open it and show you what I'm referring to. But the shiny Nav bar. Uh, navigation, navigation bar. Uh, maybe, yes, maybe it is a navigation bar. And, and each one of these links, that's a good point. Each one of these links will open a new page. The option of this 
I guess if you want to call it a hamburger, these stacked three lines is a common uh, visual for most web pages. Um, this allows you to open and close that navigation bar. Uh, we have some information at the top here with uh, different uh, project level percentages. These are mathematical algorithms calculations that give us uh, the output based on what I've filled in here. Uh, I'll get some math that will bump out. Okay, if I do an F12, okay, get, again, go back into those dev tools. What you're going to see is each one of these elements represents some component within each one of these pages. But I guess I, I'm not answering the core question of what this chapter is intended to convey. And that's the fact that you want to remember that each one of our document object model elements, these tags, if we'll call them that, I, I don't want to use the word tag because that's a special term within Shiny. Each one of these heading level ones, heading level twos, paragraph tags, you know, uh, uh, div tags, et cetera, each one of them are a mini piece of instruction with textual media and addition instruction to render on the web page. And as I'm using this debug client, I'm highlighting each one of those various elements. This is important and it is pertinent to the chapter in regard to being able to comprehend exactly what Shiny is doing as a, as a language. Initially, I found it very difficult. I was coming from a web development experience coming into Shiny and then rendering this fluid page and sidebar panel and nav page and et cetera. All of these elements within the Shiny language. And then when I would run the app and magically get this output, I'm like, what is going on? Why, what, what's the relationship between these two? And it wasn't until some experience, some in-depth reading that I started making association to okay, now I understand. This particular call within the Shiny language is developing this format output for an HTML web-friendly uh, service. They mean the same thing. They're aliases of each other, right? And then by comprehending, recognizing that that was occurring, now as I'm developing the Shiny app and I go over to my web page, I can start thinking of more of a common web-friendly language instead. Uh, uh, let me rephrase that term. A more industrial enterprise web framework service versus what Shiny is calling it. There is a big difference. There's a huge, huge difference. Let's keep going. Okay, under the hood, um, what does a typical web app contain? We have the front end, which again is your browser. Again, if you're using Chromium, if you're using a Chrome, uh, Firefox, uh, Safari, Microsoft Edge, Microsoft Internet Explorer, all of these are your front end. They're your browser. Uh, your HTML files contain the text, the uh, not only the text, but actually the hierarchical layout of your document itself. It also contains the instructions of additional resources, this JavaScript and CSS that we can access. We have our CSS files. Normally those are a separate contained location uh, and within our HTML text document, we are going to make reference to the location, the namespace reference to where they're stored at. Now, the thing that's gonna blow your mind, the thing that will make this all so much more, uh, hopefully easier to, to realize, your cascading style sheets and your JavaScript, they can be stored anywhere in the world, right? I just need the namespace pointer of where I can go find that resource so that when my web page builds, the document object model knows to go access that media type and then render with those instructions the format that I want it to be in. It doesn't necessarily have to be contained within the one service. These can be ephemeral in any location. Uh, we just need to access them. And then we have our JavaScript, which handles most interactivity. So the way I want to, I want the way I want to convey these three forms of web service is HTML is going to have your text and the instructions to render the page. The cascading style sheet is going to be how I want it to look, how I want it to appear on the screen. 
the, uh, possibly the placement of where I want my information on that uh, web page. And then the JavaScript component is the interactivity. Uh, if that is mathematical calculations, if that is uh, button press, when I uh, select a radio button, what reactive call do I want to go back to my server? Um, JavaScript is going to provide you that service. On the server's end, the back end, okay, now we're, we're going to talk about the, the, uh, the server application. These are going to receive requests received from the client. So the browser asks for information, the server provides it. Uh, our performance computations based on those requests, these are normally where you have your inputs and outputs, these placeholders. So if I have an input, the server is expecting to receive information. Um, the output on the user's end is a placeholder of where I'm going to render that media from the server. Uh, and then our send and receiving responses from the client. Okay, I'm going to compare it to a very early statement that I made as we were all coming together. Let's go all the way back to the very beginning topic. If I wanted to have this contained in one app.r file, there's nothing wrong with that. You can do that. You can have your UI and your server calls in one script file. There's nothing that says you can't do that. Where this becomes a larger problem is as you scale your application, the shiny app that you're building, the web page that you're building, this information knowledge base that you're building. As it grows, you need to start putting this information in different places and then continually stitch it back together in one format so that when it renders, it knows where all of these additional resources are located. And what I'm saying is the difference between the UI.R file and the server.R file. It is most recommended. I'm not telling you you have to do it right now, but it would be advantageous for you in the future to start rendering your shiny apps with a UI.R versus a server.R because what it's doing is separating the, the instruction between these two points. And it does make the web development uh, or the generation mastering shiny generation easier. Any questions so far? Any thoughts so far? Yeah, I, I have a question. I, I think it uh, could be a silly one, but how, how would you run um, the app when you have the i.r separate and the server.r separate? So how, how would one run that particular app? So normally on the server's side of the script, let me go back to R real quick, Lucy, that's an outstanding question. At the very bottom, no, oh, sorry. At the very bottom, you have two calls that are important. The first one is this run application call. So we're saying shiny app, UI equals UI, server equals server. So this line of text is pointing at the differences between this particular named uh, object, the UI, and this named object, the server. So that one line of text, the Shiny app is calling to develop or to generate, uh, instantiate the web server. And it's passing two variables, the name UI and the name server. So we're calling it UI is UI, server is server. But these could be any named, named uh, object that we want to call them. You just need to make sure you update it down here. If I called this, I don't know. Uh, let's just do that. And we'll do this down here. Right. As long as I keep those two points the same, it will render the same way. Let me, let me answer it this way. This doesn't really matter. The name that we have provided, as long as we follow the semantics of our studio, this doesn't matter. I just need to make sure that I'm referencing the exact name reference down here. Um, in memory, that's a different subject. And Frederica is going to know what I'm referring to. We just got off a topic on the uh, named variable or named object versus the actual memory storage of what is being put in here. The other element that I'm trying to look for, nah, it's not going to do it. Sorry. At least not in this example. There's, uh, there's one where it's uh, you render your uh, session uh, it's session. There's three things that it looks for. It's render session, something, and something else. That's another important uh, component. To briefly answer Lucy's question, the instructions that you have here usually will stop 
in that UI, UI file. So any information you want to put into that UI file and then anything that you want to have in your server side. When I directly call Shiny app, run this application in my, in my current working directory, it's going to know the names of those two files and it's going to, it's going to pull those out and follow the instructions to build or to generate the document. Is that okay, a good one? Yes. Okay, yes, perfect. Yes, yes. Perfect. Great question, though. All right. Uh, what else did I want to continue with? All right. I've already uh, expressed at an early stage of our presentation uh, the idea of this developer, developer tools um, or debug tools, the term you can use it in, in different ways. Uh, developer tools allows you the ability to dump or drop into the web page directly. Um, in most cases, most developer tools, you can change, modify text within your web page. Um, you can execute and repopulate it. It is non-persistent. You're not affecting the web server itself or the place of where the uh, original file is located. Uh, what you're doing is modifying it within the rendering component of your browser. Um, Lucy. Sorry, Ryan. Yeah, go ahead, Frederica. Hi. Um, I, this this uh, HTML code is very important when you want to uh, it is. Ar yeah, arrange uh, a title or some information. Yes. Uh, but it's very useful even if when you make modification in uh, GitHub, in the redeem of the GitHub, Correct. So the, the knowledge of this uh, few uh, things in HTML uh, will make the, your life easier if you want to uh, um, it would. add the features to the text. Yes. Yeah. Well, it, it, to, to an important uh, statement, and I'm, I'm focusing on my experience with you specifically, Frederica, we want to make sure that we're not sourcing or version controlling uh, uh, these applications themselves. So if that's Node.js, if it's some other web, uh, web language, uh, there is a, there's a, an element here that we don't want to incorporate into version control. And the purpose behind it is because it's a very extremely large library, right? So let's just, as an example, use the reveal.js service that I was showing a moment ago. The requirement to generate it as a standalone web service <clears throat> would imply that you would need node language or the, the node library installed on your machine, okay? The, the CPU or the operating system has access to generate it. This particular language of instruction and the ability of compiling that pool of information that you're generating, this HTML page that you're generating, by calling on Node and compiling this information, I get a web output, this web page output. I've got a web server, the user interface, and I can exchange back and forth. Great, awesome. Node.js in its own right, when you install it, is going to, to put about 380 to 500 megs of data on your hard drive. Right? Well, I don't wanna put that into version control. A couple of reasons. First, Node.js is going to update. It's always constantly in a fluid state of change. You don't wanna store all of the, the Node.js language. So what you do is you enter that into your git ignore file. Anything uh, contained in Node modules do not include in version control. Okay, now I, as the developer, pass this to Lucy or pass this to Brendan, pass this to Frederica. When I provide you my GitHub repo, I'm going to also version control my packages.json file. Brendan, when you receive or when you mirror off of my, my uh, source media, my web page media that we're developing together, I would say just do a uh, node package manager install while in that directory. It's going to look at the package's JSON file. It's going to go to node and it's going to download all of that uh, specific instruction to your machine. What I'm expressing here is a very uh, advanced form of web development, but ultimately this is how most users are building these web pages. Um, you don't store your frameworks in version control. 
they're managed by a different agency, mostly open source for the most part. I just need to access their repo and then pull down their code to make my application run. I'm utilizing their resources to make my uh, service operate. Um, does that help, Frederica? Yeah, thanks. I, I, I want to make sure that you don't version control node. Uh, if, if you do go <laughs> down this, this rabbit hole, HTML, yes, you do want to store that. And most of your media types, uh, if it's the CSS file, if it's the JavaScript, or if it's the uh, images that you're generating, uh, media that you're generating, accessing. Um, I'll take a I'll take this opportunity briefly to talk a, a, about a different subject. We've had a, a one of our users ask multiple times about the um, shiny application itself and the data science or data analysis workflow. How do I run my script? How do I provide my media to my other user? Okay, again, I'm building the app, and the team that's on this call is going to be accessing it. So, how do I serve this? data set to you to allow the shiny application to render it to use it okay um and it's the the answer to that question is is very uh in depth you can have it as a database you can have it as a stored location on another server you can have it as you know a json file a a xml file a csv file however you want to serve it that's your choice what i would recommend in thought process of building the shiny app however is always remember the network is your is your weakest link right brendan i don't know what type of computer you're using to render my web page so i can't i i don't know what that would be so i need to optimize it in the simplest and easiest form for your computer to compile um uh, olu maybe your particular computer you know, you, you're running on a supercomputer, so you're going to be able to have the best networks and the, and the best CPU processing power. You can you can uh, chew through some some data really fast. Right. Well, I have to be agnostic to the user's access to my information, so I'm going to choose a service that will be most optimized for all users. Um, and that thought process of being agnostic is key. I don't know what operating system you're going to be rendering this on, nor is it a concern of mine that I should worry about. Now, if I have a particular feature that is only specific to particular browsers, yes, that is important because you don't want to alienate somebody without rendering. Um, you'll find that happen a lot in the differences between Chrome and Firefox versus Internet Explorer. Um, some pages just won't render or the other way around. You have to use this one browser to access this, this information. Well, in that mindset, you're limiting the ability of 100% of the population accessing your, your information um, by saying, I'm going to use this particular widget and it's only applicable to Internet Explorer. Well, OK, 60% of your entire population is not going to be able to access it. OK. All right, let's keep moving. Um, this example that we have here is a simple HTML page. And if I were to save this and render it, um, I would be able to open it. But let's just talk about what each one of these points are. Now, there's a term for this, and I, I use the word tag, but that term is only applied to uh, web framework. The use of the term tag in our studio implies a different application. So again, I want to be careful that I'm not mixing and matching your thought process here. What we have at the first type is doc type. I'm telling the document object model, this is going to be an HTML page. This is called a preamble. The preamble is required on all levels of HTML, or well, all levels of web framework. You will always see a preamble. Now, it may contain different information, but ultimately, you will always have this as the first entry. Um, if you're writing a bash script, you will always have the crunch bang at the beginning of your bash script, right? That's the preamble telling it that it is a bash script. Uh, the next one is called the HTML tag, and we notice that it always has an opening and closing mark. The opening tag does not have the forward slash. The closing tag will always have the forward slash. Okay. If I open a tag, I must close it. The head, okay, the head has an opening tag and a closing tag. Inside the head is where you put most of your metadata, possibly your script references, your CSS references, um, or the 
unique attribute title. Frederica just made a mention of the, the title page. That will always be contained in head. You don't have to have the head to render your HTML page. You don't have to have the head. You can delete it off of there and it'll still render properly. But what you're going to be removing by taking that uh, feature away is the uh, placeholder of the document object model to access other media types. By cutting it off, you're just kind of making it more static, I guess. Um, the body tag, you can't have an HTML page without body. It is at the core of the importance of, of what is going on here. So again, the body tag is where you're going to put all of your data, put all of your information. Um, Lucy, to your benefit, it would be where the, um, this would be similar to the fluid page. The body would be similar to the fluid page. Um, all of my different navigation points and sidebars and et cetera, they're always going to render into that body tag. Uh, in this example, we have a comment, content goes here. Um, in HTML, the use of a, uh, of a comment is going to be uh, the greater than symbol, excuse me, that's less than symbol, uh, exclamation point dash dash. That's the entry of a, of a comment in HTML. It will not render on your, on your screen. Uh, whatever text you wanna put there and then the closure is gonna be a dash dash and then greater than sign. Uh, I'm not telling you, you have to do this. I'm saying, uh, what's the best way to put this? HTML is extremely ephemeral. Um, and in and, and today's technology, similar to this topic with our studio, we are using a service that renders HTML. We're generating or compiling output to be HTML. If you put comments in there, it doesn't imply that it will be generated on the output end or vice versa. If I have my compiled HTML page and then I go in and I start editing, adding comments, changing stuff, go back to my originating service that, that generated the HTML, run it again, it may overwrite whatever I just generated or whatever I just wrote. Does that make sense? Uh, I'm saying don't always implicitly modify your HTML page because it may not live forever. It may get recompiled, reproduced. All right, finally, we have uh, inside the body tag, we have an H1, which is heading one, paragraph tag, P tags, and then this closure of body. Now, if I, if I were to render this page, all you would have is my printed title, and then underneath there, a paragraph of text. And there you have it, there's your web page. Uh, at the very top of your browser, the tab itself, the title attribute uh, is what goes up to your title page. Um, so again, it would say the page title. Uh, using <clears throat> writing HTML with Shiny and HTML tools. Well, we've talked about the differences between R Studio as a language versus the HTML, JavaScript, and CSS output on the other end. By evoking the HTML tools feature within R Studio, it immediately gives you access to insert raw HTML into your Shiny app. And then during the document object compiling or the rendering output end, it, uh, knitting, I guess, if you want to use that term, then it would automatically bring those HTML elements directly into the web page. So as an example, <clears throat> we have a user input and we're going to create this Shiny fluid page. Inside, uh, we create this cat function as character UI. And then we close uh, our, as another example, div class container fluid, and then close div. Render page. Uh, I think render page is the, the element I was after with its session and then two other things. And please, if anybody wants to err off of what I'm trying to recall off the top of my head, um, I don't have a direct example that I can point at to explain. But there's three elements in that render page that you're required. When I generate this output, this is the textual media that would be generated. It looks similar to what we were showing before. We have our preamble, doctype HTML. We have our tag HTML. Inside the head, we have, uh, what is it? I guess eight or 10 elements here. We've got some meta media uh, scripting links. Uh, a link is a, a HTML reference, href. Um, 
pointing at a folder in, on our machine or on the web server shared and then shiny minimum CSS. Um, we're rendering it as a style sheet. Uh, another JavaScript call where I'm pointing at my shared folder with shiny minimum JS. Uh, not to sidestep the head attribute. There's just a lot of activity that goes on in the head of your HTML page, uh, and most of which is generated by the compiling component. So you're not directly entering it. You can modify it. Yes, you can tell explicitly instruction on what services you want inside there. Um, otherwise, most of this is all done for you during compiling. What is going to have though is this div tag as a starting point, this body nav. If I want to add bare HTML, just common. Mm -hmm. Are we over time? Sorry. Yeah, we have four minutes, but I have oh, okay, question. excellent. All right. Yeah, I what is the cat function doing here? I, I think I didn't get that. Well, I, I think it's just concatenation, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and I in reference to this above call, I think we're putting out to the screen, we're concatenating, uh, we're 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 expressing to the output what is generated by using the library shiny and the function render page. I think by by running this cat call, it is when I when I say run page and I had that point in my script, this generated output would be uh, received on the on the console output. Let me go back to our studio real quick. And I can probably try this. Let's just give it a shot. Uh, cat, that's a function call, render, shiny. Was it rendered UI, render, render app? And then we were calling this UI. And close the tag. Was that correct? Did I? No, 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 no. Sorry, team jumping around here to answer the question. Render page, sorry, render page. Back to our studio, render page. All right, let's just save that real quick. Control save and just run that function. That didn't do what I wanted it to. I think the app is still, the app is still running, oh, right? Was it, I'm sorry, that's a good point. You are correct. So now let's see. Now I need to run the app, but then, mm, yeah, now I just buggered up a whole bunch of other details here. Save that. Now try running. I didn't. Oh, I'm shiny directly. It's telling me that I don't have the named object shiny. Object shiny not found. All right. Well, I believe that's the intent, Lucy, to your benefit. I believe what the cat call is referencing is the concatenation, the uh, stand out, the what am I generating here? And I believe what that does is it it puts it out to the console itself. I'm 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 90% confident with that statement. Okay, thank you. Yes. So um, sorry, sorry, Ryan. Uh, the, the, there was three three dots. Oh, did I put too many? Did I put too many dots there? Three, no, no. There's three dots. Uh, I, I, yeah. Okay. Now maybe try it. No. Okay. No, no I'm not finding the UI. Maybe you need you need to run the. Yeah. There, that's what did it. That's what did it, Lucy. Do you see what uh, what occurred? So when yes. I when I said yes. run app trial, and I had that concatenation output, um, it just puts out the textual document that would be generated on the web page uh, in in plain text. 
So okay. you would be able to inspect it if, if you would want to. I guess as a, as a final topic to this presentation, I want the team to re remember that this is foreign. It, it does look weird. It does appear I'm writing in one language and I'm generating in a second alternate output language. There are, when you're in the debug or, or development tools of the web page after rendering, you can start making connections with when I make this call on my shiny UI or, or server.r file, and then here's the element that gets generated in my web page. Making that association will help you. But I want to be forward and say that it may not be the same named output. So there's where the possible uh, scratching head comes in. If anybody has any questions about this detail, please call me uh, uh, or, or ping me on Slack. Uh, uh, communicate in some manner. Um, I'll be more than happy to take a closer look at what it is you're trying to apply and then be able to uh, guide you in, in a possible reference or a library access within Shiny to, to utilize what we're doing. That was all I had. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ren. Um, it was a very insightful discussion. Yeah, uh, it has made me understand more after reading the chapter. Um, so, uh, Okay, so I, I realize uh, uh, we have we handled the layout. I, I don't think if you've handled the, have we? I think we have. I can, well, <laughs> no. The slides are different from how the they book, are. how and the slides I, are arranged is different from the book, yeah. And I didn't, I didn't, so I, I purposely, I did this last uh, cohort as well. I didn't have an active slide deck because the conversation of JavaScript, CSS and, and HTML isn't conveyed well in a static slide deck. Um, I'm not saying that it can't be. It's more intuitive to witness it in, in activity, uh, witness it in real time, dump into dev tools and actually start to mess around with a web page. Um, I apologize. I didn't know. I didn't go that far. And if we would like to, I'd be happy to, to continue this topic next week um, with the layout uh, conversation. Um, if that if that's an opportunity we want to continue with. Yeah. Um, so, what do you team suggest? Do we handle the layout and then proceed to chapter seven, or we start with chapter seven? I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it up to the team or or yourself. I'm I'm good either way. Uh, so I think Brendan, are you in agreement? We continue or not? Okay, we can follow up the discussion on the chats. I'm also good with either. Uh, I think it would be best to finish up the layout side, the layout parts, and then now we start with Federica uh, handling the chapter seven. Okay. Is that okay? I was, I was quickly trying to find our Google page. I was going to open up our Google Sheets sign up to see who was. There it is. That's what I was looking for. I'm next. So Federica's next. Okay. Yeah. If yeah. if you want, you you can even start the next session, and then uh, if you finish up earlier, and start with the uh, with the chapter, and then I don't know. It's up to you. I will do my best to keep it as short and sweet as possible, Frederica. Um, with the topic of layouts, it's it's really that theming concept I had I had referenced. Um, the various elements of layouts. It, it shouldn't take us very long. Okay. Uh, thank you. That is a plan. And unfortunately, next weekend, I will not be joining the group as I'll be traveling to Manchester and I will I will not be in a position to join the discussion. However, I will um, follow up on, I will watch the recording as I did from last week. So please do continue the discussion and I will join in the incoming week. Okay, thank you and have yourself a good day, good morning and <laughs> yeah, whatever day you point of the day you are yeah thank you everyone thank you bye. thank you okay thank you bye